Well, trust, that is, that is the word. That's the word of the series that we are in. Uh, if you are a guest with us, we're walking through the book of Luke, and uh, we've been focusing on that word, which is easy to talk about, and it's hard to live out. Because the thing about trust is it's revealed by our behaviors. The way that we act will tell people what we trust. That's why Luke wrote his gospel, Luke 1 verse 4 says he wrote this so we could have certainty concerning the things that we have been taught. He wants us to be so certain about who Jesus is that it changes our behavior. And so we're, we're going to look at this today in the context of, well, a moment that reveals where trust really lies. And that is in a storm. Now I'm going to ask the low-hanging fruit question. Has anybody been through a storm before? Show of hands. Great. Some, some of them are like, I'm in one right now. I'm sitting in the black hole spot, all right? So we're, we're getting these lights fixed, but y'all better show up to church early next week because they're coming for your seats. <clears throat> so I appreciate your all's grace there. We, we know that trust is revealed in behavior. If, I, if I'm going to do a trust fall and I'm like, all right, I, I say I trust you, and you're like, fall on. I'm like, I trust you, and you fall on. I trust you. If I never fall, do I really trust you? No. It's just belief. Belief becomes trust when we act, and so we can look at our actions to know what we really believe, and there's a storm that shows up in the Gospels that reveals what the disciples really believe. So turn to Luke chapter 8, verse 22 is where we're going to start. It says, one day he, that's Jesus, he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. This is the same lake where he met Peter already, so a lot of ministry happens there, the Sea of Galilee. He says, let us go across to the other side of the lake. And so they set out, and they sailed. And as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a wind storm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went, and they woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the, wa the raging waves, and they ceased. And there was a calm. He said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid. And they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even the winds and water, and they obey him? Now this is a familiar text for, for many of us. And it's a text that leads us to two questions. Where is your faith, and who is Jesus? Now, I really believe that these two questions, every person is going to answer. Now or for eternity. You will answer for where you've placed your faith and for what you decided about Jesus. And so it's very important not only that we ask these questions, but that we get these answers right. So let's look at the first question. Where is your faith? Now when Jesus asks that question in verse 24, he's not asking because he doesn't know. All right, As if he's like, oh man, that was a crazy storm. We probably lost some stuff over the edge. Anybody lose your faith? Anyone? Matthew's like, I lost my lunch. My faith probably went with it. I'm sure it's back there somewhere, Jesus. Like, it's, it's not that Jesus didn't know, because Jesus is God. When God asks questions in Scripture, if you're studying the Bible on your own, and God or Jesus asks a question, it's never for them. It's always for the person they're asking it to. And so he says, where is your faith? Because that's the question they should be asking themselves. Based on their behavior, this storm really has revealed where their faith is. And so to answer the question, you look back up at the story. The story answers it for us. First of all, their faith was not in the words of Jesus. Look back at verse 22. What does Jesus say to them? Let us go across to the other side of the lake. He does not say, let us go to the middle of the lake and die. He did not say, we're going to go to the middle of the lake. We're going to lose a few of you, but I'll save my favorites. No, he says, let us go to the other side. That's what he says which means Jesus has already declared there's a destination that I am bringing you to. Problem solved. But somewhere believe, between believing that enough and arriving at the destination God had, when things got uncertain and uneasy and unmanageable and they weren't calm anymore and it wasn't the plan, they forgot what Jesus said. Can you relate to that? Hey, I've got enough faith to follow you, but suddenly a storm in life hits, and it's like I can't remember any of the promises that you've given me in your word. I start responding to my moment instead of responding to my Savior, and they forget. So not only 
Was there trust not in his words? It also wasn't in his example. Where do you find Jesus in this story? Look back at the text. What's he doing during the storm? Sleeping. It's fantastic. How many of you was that last night, by the way? You're like, I'm good. <laughs> my, my people, they're like, I, I talked to a guy this morning um, at Starbucks, and he was like, I just thought if I wake up in the air, okay. <laughs> and I was like, cool, man. It's, it's good. So like, th- here's Jesus. The storm is raging, and he's just taking a nap. Now, you would look at this, and this, this is what's wild, is we should be taking our cues from Jesus. They wake him up as if to be like Jesus. You don't know what's going on. Maybe you're not paying attention. They say we, which includes him, we are perishing. Have you ever prayed like that? God, maybe you're not paying attention. Maybe you're asleep on me. Maybe, maybe you forgot that I've been asking for this. And I, God, there's some stuff going on down here. We could really use you. Have you ever prayed like maybe you, God's response or Jesus' response, they've got it wrong. Here's the thing. They've never got it wrong. If Jesus rests through storms, maybe we should too. In fact, we should look at the life of Jesus, and whatever works him up, that's what should work us up. And if it doesn't, it shouldn't us either. It's a great thing to evaluate your life by. What are the things that get me worked up and make me feel like things are falling apart? And does that match the things that concern Jesus? Because if he's not concerned about it, why, why would I be? So they're, they're not following his, his example much either. And, th- and that's the thing, because if they were, they wouldn't be given to despair. Now, the danger was real. Hear me, hear me say that. Look back at the text. It says they were in danger. Not they thought they were in danger. Not they could have been. Their boat's taking on water. The danger is very real. And in our lives, the danger is real. Following Jesus does not protect us from danger, but it should keep us from despair. This was Jesus' idea, remember? He said, let's get in the boat and go. He was leading them to and through the storm. So if you're following Jesus, he might lead you into storms. Following Jesus will not keep you out of danger, but it should keep you from despair. Why? Because Jesus is going to get where he's promised to take us. If your faith's in Jesus, there's no reason to despair because he's going to keep his word which means if your life is full of despair, then your faith, back to the question, where's my faith, may not be in Jesus. It might be somewhere else. And I hear it all the time. I hear brothers and sisters who love the Lord, but they're just walking around nowadays, despair, 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 and fret, 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 and worry, worry, worry. The boat's going down. Some of y'all, like, if you're like, Cody, I said that this week. Hey, that's fine, all right? That's why, that's why we're here together. But I do, I, I hear it, and they're like, oh, I'm just telling you, the, the, the government, it's just, it's going down, and, and our nation, it's not, and kids these days, you know, and chain restaurants, that one I kind of get. <laughs> like, they're just not as good as they once were, you know, and you're like, ah. Oh. But, but like, the, but the, the thing is, like, people just walk around, and it's, oh, man, it's falling apart. If your life starts to fall apart because something else is falling apart, your hope, identity, and faith are in the wrong place. Because the things that can fall apart will. Psalm 46, kingdoms, or uh, nations rage, kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The things of this life, nations, governments, schools, chain restaurants, I don't know, all, all of it, they exist by the word and sovereignty of God. And at any given moment, those things can crumble. But if our hope is in Christ, we don't have to crumble with them. So it's good to to recognize when a storm comes through, it reveals what things will last and what things won't. And we as believers need to make sure, we not as believers, we as humans had better make sure we've put our faith in something that will last. And that's that's what leads us where we're headed. Now, uh, before we get to the next question, we need to consider one other thing. All right, because we're looking at this and thinking, oh, I've got to put my faith in what's going to last through the storm. Now, sometimes 
we can hear this story and start to head a wrong direction with it. It's a good one, but it's not the best one. We start to think, all right, so I need to put my faith in Jesus no matter what's going on, no matter what's falling apart. My faith is in him so he can get me to smooth waters on the other side. Put my faith in Jesus so that way I can conquer every storm that comes in my life. And so, so do you guys remember the WWJD bracelet? It looked, looked like this. How many of you guys remember one of those? All right, the WWJD. What would you, so it, it's a good thought, right? I'm gonna, how is Jesus handling this? That's how I'm going to handle it. What would Jesus do? And we can start to think that every single storm in life is just kind of happenstance, and I just got to do what Jesus would do. Um, there's another thought we need to have, because on one hand, it's true. Jesus led the disciples into this storm, right? They got into this mess by obeying Jesus. That's not the case with every storm. Do you guys remember how Jonah got into a storm? Dude was running from God. It was the total opposite. He ends up in a storm because he is not listening to the voice of God. He's rejecting what it is God had to say. He made a series of decisions that got him into the middle of a storm. And so he needed a bracelet that looked more like this one. Do we have the other bracelet? Jesus would not have been in this situation in the first place. That, that's the bracelet that sometimes we need. Sometimes we're like, oh man, storms of life, what would Jesus do? I, you know, what would Jesus do if he was caught cheating on his spouse? Well, that's the thing. What, he wouldn't. wouldn't be. What would Jesus do if he punched his boss? Not going to happen. You, you stopped asking the right questions seven questions ago. Sometimes, listen, sometimes in life, we have rejected the voice of God. We've ignored the authority of God. We put our trust and hope in other things. And it's just taken us down a road that we look up one day and we're like, what would Jesus do? And we're like, well, Jesus was way back there and you didn't listen. And sometimes the storm is of our own creation. And so uh, what I want to protect us from is thinking, all right, today's message is like, no matter what situation we're in, I turn to Jesus. That is true. But the, the, point's not, the point's not the storm. And a lot of times we hear this and we just start thinking about all the storms in our life. And I wonder why God sent that storm or how did I get into this storm or those kind of things. The point of this text when we leave church today is not that you've identified your storms more clearly. It's that you know your Savior more fully. When we leave today, the whole point of this text is who Jesus is. Not what storm you're facing. And the good news is, whether it's a storm Jesus is leading you into, or whether it's a storm that you got into yourself, he is faithful to save you if you turn to him. That's the best news of today. And we get there by knowing who Jesus is. That's the second question. The disciples see him bring calm to the raging storms. He asks about their faith, and they say, who is this? Now, similarly, uh, they, they know who it is, all right? So, okay, you know, kids in the room, if you're like, how did they not know Jesus? I thought they got in the boat with Jesus. So, like, why uh, was Jesus in disguise? Like, you know, this guy calms the storm, and one of the disciples like, hey, Peter, who's that guy? When did he get, like, they knew who he was, but they just experienced something from Jesus that made them question if they really knew who he was. I, I, I just want to, can anybody relate to that in your faith? That you're like, I'm following Jesus, but then sometimes you learn something, you experience something, you read something in scripture, and you're like, whoa, I thought I knew who he was. He is so much more than I thought. Anybody? It's my story over and over. I want to encourage you. That's what following Jesus looks like. Uh, these people were following Jesus. They had enough faith to get in the boat and go where Jesus was going. But along the path of following Jesus, he is going to lead us into and through things that cause us to ask bigger questions and get a bigger view of who he is. So if you're following Jesus, there will be times that you have more questions than when you started. There will be times that you are more amazed than you were, that you are more afraid of, of his sovereignty and his power than you were, that you're more in awe and enamored with and you adore him more than you did. That's where he leads you. Which means the inverse should concern us. If you say, I'm following Jesus, but you never have another thought about how incredible he is, about how astounding and eternal and sovereign he is. You never, have, you never fear him more. You never love him more. You don't learn anything new about him. Then I would question if you're really following Jesus. 
Because the disciples are in this continual journey that he's going, all right, now I can show you this. Now I can show you this. Now you can see this. And if you're following him, friends, some of you have followed him longer than I've been alive. My friend Warren earlier was like, I really did the math today. I'm 48 years older than you. And I was like, you, you are. He's like, I've seen Jesus do a lot of things. You haven't even been alive that long. That's right. So some of you have done that, and you know this is true. It's impossible to mine the depths of the goodness of God. If you're following him, you'll see it. And if you never have another thought about God, be concerned. You may not be in the right boat. So, Jesus reveals himself. Now, in the same way, he reveals himself through the text, through the story, j just like with the last question. Who is Jesus? Well, first, Jesus is fully man. This is a, uh, some, we're going to get into some doctrinally important statements. All right, Jesus is fully man. He's 100% human. You look, what's Jesus doing in the boat? He's sleeping. God rests, but God doesn't sleep. He doesn't need to sleep. You know who needs to sleep? People, humans. Jesus reveals his humanity by getting in the boat and being like, man, I need a nap. Now, this is really important, I think, for a few reasons. Reason number one, when I nap, I am like Jesus. I'm so excited about that. <laughs> Because this afternoon, I'm going to be like, just, just being like my Savior. <laughs> Kids, you all play, and I'm going to sleep through the storm. <laughs> so that, that's one. Number two, this roots Jesus in historical accuracy. This reminds us Jesus was a historical person. Historians don't argue if Jesus existed. They, they argue about the figure he was and what he meant, but nobody argues Jesus of Nazareth was a real person in human history, executed by the Romans, put in a tomb, and his body wasn't there anymore. Historical fact. And because of the claims Jesus made and that surrounded his life, every person has to ask the question, if that Jewish man really existed, died, and rose again, and he claimed to be God, and the only way to God, I've got a deal. So everyone has to answer the question, who is Jesus? Because he existed. He's fully man. The third reason this is important is the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, it actually tells us that Jesus had to become the God, the fullness of God, had to become fully man so he could serve as a high priest for us and make atonement for our sins, meaning that Jesus had to take on a human experience so he could live a sinless life and he could die in our place and his shed blood would be the sacrifice to forgive us of sins we needed a person to do that and jesus did it it also means he can empathize with all of our weaknesses if you're ever praying to god and you're wondering if he gets you and he understands you if he knows what that's like jesus has been betrayed he has been rejected he has had friends he has lost friends he's been through storms he's been alone he's been with groups he has been tired jesus knows what it's like to just be tired he understands us he's fully man but he's also the only person in all of human history to be equally fully god it's only happened once in all of human history. Fully man, fully God. Now, if you're a theology nerd, it's called hypostatic union. It's something that you could write down and read about. There's some great articles in a lot of church history that explain this. He's fully both, which means he, he's not like kind of God and kind of man. He's completely man, completely God. And we see this in the, as he displays that he speaks to the wind and waves and they obey his voice. We don't do that. That's something only God does. Now, this was a convicting moment as I studied this. Because I studied, and I was like, wait a second. It seems like the wind and the waves listen better than the disciples. And they listen a lot better than me. So I had to ask the question, as I, just sitting alone with the Lord. I was like, am I worse than a puddle of water at listening to God? That was my question. I was like, Lord, is that true? The puddles of water listen to you better than I do. I don't know if you guys have ever looked at the wind. Like, you'll notice wind doesn't have ears. There's not just ears flying around. If you see that, you should probably go get that checked out. It's not normal, right? Wind doesn't have ears, but wind listens to God. It's what Drew preached on last week, right? He who has ears, let him hear. Not just, not just un get it, but live about it. Listen to it. Obey it. And I had to be confronted that when the wind and the waves hear the voice of Jesus, they do not hesitate. They obey immediately. And do you know what follows immediate obedience? Calm. It says there was calm. 
the applied word of God to our lives brings calm because we trust him because he's faithful because he's enough. I found myself wanting to respond like that. And the reason that the wind and the waves obey him is because Jesus is completely God. I'm going to turn over to Psalm 107. Psalm 107 is this beautiful psalm that tells multiple stories. And in the middle of each story, it drops the refrain that they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. Situation, and that's right in the middle of it every time. You get to verse 23, and it says this, that some went down to the sea in ships and they were doing business on the great waters and they saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep, for he commanded and raised the stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea, and they mounted up to heaven, and they went down to the depths, and their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled, and they staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storms be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven." Psalm 107 is written about God and God alone who delivers people that call on him out of their distress. This is also the story of the disciples. This is exactly what happened. They reeled. They're at their wit's end. They cry out, and Jesus responds. He not only proves to be God by commanding wind and waves, the natural order of things, Jesus proves he is God by carrying out the very nature of God. That when he is called upon to save, he responds. That's what this text is about. This text is about the fact that Jesus is Savior to those who call on him. And whether you are following him and you get stuck in a storm and something in your life just starts to ravage your life and you find yourself fretting and despairing and looking at all these other things and then you remember, wait, I have the Savior with me. I've been so consumed with all these other things and And given to despair, I don't have to despair. Christians, we do not have to despair because we have the Savior in the boat. And this storm doesn't matter. And it's not even about getting to the other side of the storm. It's about getting your faith in the right place. Which is why the the disciples, by the way, didn't go from fear or from calm to fear to calm, right? When Jesus calms all of the waters, they would have been like, all right, thanks, Jesus, you got us through it. You can go back to sleep. We've got it from here. Isn't that how a lot of us want to live our faith, right? Smooth waters, so smooth, Jesus can just nap. Probably don't even need his help. And then things get rough, and we're like, save us, Jesus. They're like, all right, go and go back to sleep. I'll let you know if I need, no, no, not the disciples. They go from calm to fear to fear. Because when they realize, wait, he's the one that controls all of this, now they're asking the most important question. Have I, have I had God right in front of me and I've still put my faith in other things? I'll tell you, friends, that's, a, that's actually a scary place to be. To think we could live our lives with the presence of God, the good news of God right in front of you, but you keep putting your faith in all the other things because one day this life ends and we're going to give an account for that. And so what's true for the Christian in the storm who followed Jesus into it? Man, I've been distracted, but God, I remember you are with me, so I will not despair. I will turn to you because you're my only hope. Is true for the person who's never turned to God ever. If your life is marked by despair, by emptiness, by storms, maybe you're way down the road and you're like, Cody, I'm about 30 decisions away from WWJD. And I've been hiding it, I've been faking it, whatever, but maybe your life's over here. The thing that is true for the disciples is true for you. It's true for the person in Psalm 107. If you turn to God, he will save you. It doesn't matter how far you've gone, doesn't matter how many things you've done, doesn't matter how much failure you've had, doesn't matter how many sins have mounted up, those waves of your sins can be at the top, (laughs) they can rise to the heavens, they can crash to the depths, Even there, the presence of God will respond if you call on him. That's what we leave knowing today. We leave Christians encouraged 
that when our faith and hope and identity is put with Christ, we never have to despair. And if we get distracted, all we have to do is turn to him and he's faithful to save. And for those that have never done that, never once put your faith to say, I reject the old and I'm going to follow. I'm in. If you've never done that, no matter where you're at, you can do that today. You can say, I reject my old life. It's time to start a new one. I'm following Jesus. He will save you. Let's spend some time in prayer together. God, as we close our time, I pray that you would move in our hearts. For those that belong to you in this room, may they be encouraged. May be, they be reminded that you are fully faithful, fully powerful, fully gracious, fully just. And you are faithful to save, and you chose to save us through the work of Jesus. For those of us that have been given to despair because of little things of this life, would you remind us where our faith should be and bring us back to you? And then, God, I pray for those who do not have a relationship with you, and deep down they know it. They've played the game, but their life is marked by storm after storm. Their eyes just are continually off of you. I pray that right now, in this moment, they would believe that you can save, and they would turn to you for salvation, that they would call out to you and say, God, I'm rejecting the old. I'm leaving sin. I'm following you. Forgive me. And grant me the new life that you promise. God, I pray that as they turn to you in that, that they would realize they're, they're being saved. Lord, we thank you that you are our Savior and we don't have to wonder about it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you look up, I want to invite you to stand up and we're going to close our